Revelation chapter 11. An absolutely incredible chapter. Revelation chapter 11. Contains a very impressive and powerful story, in many ways probably one of my favourite stories in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11, just going to read verse 1. John writes, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer courts, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. Let's come to prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we just want to thank you this morning for being able to gather before you to study your word. We ask and pray, Lord, that you speak into our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that you send your Holy Spirit very powerfully up and down the aisle and amongst the pews, that you impress these truths upon our minds, that you give us understanding of this passage in Scripture. Lord, that we learn something from it, that we're able to go out and live a more effective life to the glory of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just ask you to uplift each and every one of us, uplift the weaknesses of the preacher this morning. Lord, we also do think of Tanya and Brenda, who both had operations this week, and we just pray in your grace that you bring healing and that you remove the pain in their bodies. And Lord, that your name is glorified. We commit them and their families to you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. As we turn to the book of Revelation this morning, we have reached the midpoint of this entire book. A book where we have learned so much about the end of time and about the return of Jesus Christ. And the reason is, is because the main focus of this entire book is to reveal Jesus Christ to you and I. How Jesus Christ is one day going to return to this earth with great power and great glory. How he will judge the wicked. How Jesus is going to go out to reward the righteous. All starting and beginning in Revelation chapter 6. In relation to a little scroll that is found in the hand of God the Father as he sits on his throne. Now you'll remember that that little scroll was sealed with seven seals and on each side of the page was writing. Writing on both sides. And each time Jesus took that scroll and broke a seal, a page of history literally unfolds to form and show a judgment that God sends against the world in which we live. All as God brings this present world to an end and takes this world back for himself. Now we have gone through six seals on the scroll. We are now in the seventh seal of God, awaiting to hear the blowing of the seventh trumpet of God. Now when the seventh trumpet is blown, seven bold judgments then follow from heaven. It, uh, and as we study into that, you'll see an angel step forward, he takes a bowl and he empties it out on the earth. And then later a second angel comes forward and empties a bowl upon the earth. And judgment follows judgment follows judgment. Judgment so horrific, so powerful in life. That God allows Christians as a way of comfort and interlude, as it were, before it actually happens. Not only for us and for John who was writing this vision down, but for the Christians that would have been living on the earth at the time that these judgments actually take place. As a way of upliftment, as a way of encouragement for them personally. In that they may have been turning around and asking questions such as, when is God going to bring this world to an end? When is God going to stop the judgment striking this planet? Why doesn't God allow the, uh, 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 why doesn't God, why does God allow Christians to suffer in life? Now I'm sure that many of us sitting here have often turned and asked that question. Why do Christians suffer in daily life? Why doesn't God bring an end to evil? Why doesn't God stop the devil and put him to an end right now? And so God is one who turns and he puts Revelation chapter 10 right here at the midpoint of this book as a chapter to encourage Christians, 
To say to Christians, listen, no matter how bad things get in the world in which you are living, no matter the issues that are facing you personally in your own daily life, no matter how hard things are and confusing, I as God am in, in charge. And as God, I am one who is working all things so that they happen in life according to my own heavenly plan. The world in which you live is working according to the clock and the timing of myself as God. Also is to give all men and women and young people the opportunity to repent in daily life. To come to an understanding of the truth of my son Jesus Christ. For I as God do not desire anyone to perish but all to come to repentance in life. And so God is one who at times almost delays certain judgments upon our world to give people that opportunity for, to repent. And certainly by the time at this time in history, people have gone and experienced some utterly amazing things. Across the world there has been an increase in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preachers are, are proclaiming God's truth to the world. 144,000 Bible preachers have been sent out. Powerful preachers, men of great de destiny under God's hand. There's been increasing war, famines, earthquakes, tornadoes, pestilences. Literally the collapse of an entire universe around people. <coughs> With the opening of the seventh seal of God, a third of the earth has been destroyed. A third of the seas have been destroyed. A third of the ships have been wiped out. A third of the fresh water has been destroyed, says the Bible. There has been the release of the fallen angels that have been bound at the great river of Rages for centuries. And God's word says to us that they will need an army of 200 million demonic beings across the earth. And then we move into the interlude of Revelation chapter 10 to tell us all that God is in control of it. And then as Christians, we must not worry about what is happening. We mustn't get stressed out about the events happening in the world around us. The floods, the earthquakes, the tornadoes. <laughs> and as you'll remember from Revelation 10, God sought to tell us this through the appearance of an absolutely powerful, massive, unique angel of God. Remember? <clears throat> Now as we come to Revelation chapter 11 today, we come to the very appearance of two very unique preachers of God. Whom God is going to further send out in the last days of world history to, to call the world back to God in repentance. To call our world back, our friends and our family. You see, our God is a God who never ever gives up. To the world in which we live, to the people that you work with and friends and family and people you know at the club, God is often seen as a God of judgment and cruelty, a harsh God, an uncaring God. But to the Christian, God is our Father. Yes, we do not understand why God does or allows certain things to happen in, in our lives. The hardships and the difficulties and the pain of loss and suffering. We don't always have an answer in life as to why things happen the way that they do. And sometimes it's hard for you and I as Christians. But our God is a God who loved the world so much that He sent His one and only Son to come into this world to die for it. For those who turn and they put their trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation in life. Calling upon Jesus for salvation. Not turning back and looking at their good works and their good deeds to try and save them in life. Not looking at their own efforts, how wonderful they are. Not looking at how clever and talented they are or what's happened in their family or the fact that they've got a minister in the family but instead turning and bending their knee and calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, and then turning and repenting of their sins. Or in other words, doing a U-turn in their life. You're living your life one way, you do a U-turn and you start living your life in a completely different way, a way that is focused on Christ and repentance. That is repentance. Turning away from sin. And so what God does 
as we have seen in the book of Revelation, is that at times He sends judgments and difficulties and trials and hardships into our lives so as to call us as a people back to Himself. It's under trial and hardship that we turn back to God. It shouldn't be like that, but it does happen. God is not a God of cruelty, but He is a God who does work in our lives to turn us back to Him, to say, listen, it is enough. The way you are living, it is enough. You need to seek me as the living God. And so here he sends out two very unique and powerful preachers who, in our, who, our, who our world will look at with absolute horror. Look with me at Revelation chapter 11. Reading from verse 1, John writes about them. I was given a reed like a measuring rod. I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews. They will trample on the holy city, Jerusalem, for 42 months, that's three and a half years. And I will send and give power to my two witnesses, these two preachers. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days, that's three and a half years. Clothed in sackcloth, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, watch this, fire comes from their what? Mouths. And devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Let's look at this picture. Imagine uh, preachers being able to do that. Revelation chapter 1, 11 verse 6, moving on. These two men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time that they are prophesying. They have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they finish their testimony, their preaching, in other words, the beast, that's the Antichrist, the one world leader, that comes up from the abyss, the 666, will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, Jerusalem. <coughs> which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. There also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men of every people, tribe and language and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets, preachers, had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they went up into heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city of Jerusalem collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. Wow. Now these are pretty remarkable preachers from God, don't you agree? And God's pretty pacific. He says there's an earthquake, 7,000 died. Can you imagine sitting listening to a news report one day and that comes across the news? And that our world by this time will be filled with wickedness. People will be cursing God and literally mocking Christianity on a scale that we've never ever known or seen before in our world. People today turn and mock the Christian faith. They mock the church. They mock God's servants. But a time is coming when the world will be far worse than it has ever been. They will be worshipping their idols and their money and their pleasures and what suits them. In Revelation 9 verse 21, they will be full of murder and magic arts, that's, that's witchcraft and fortune telling and astrology, sexual immorality and thefts will be absolutely rife. Christians worldwide will be facing persecution and death and there will be restrictions against the preaching of the gospel and the runnings of the Christian church. Terrible punishments from God will be continually striking our world, judgment after judgment after judgment. And then in Revelation 11, God in His mercy is one who sends to the world these two preachers here in love, in grace, in compassion to warn men and women to tell them about the seventh trumpet of God that is coming. To call people to come back to Him and to repent before it is too late. Isn't this tremendous? 
in that there are not only 144,000 Billy Grahams and Angus Backhams hitting the world scene, men that the Word of God tells us will be unstoppable preachers, men of incredible prophetic destiny and daily life, as well as all the other preachers that are alive at that particular time. But there are going to be these two individuals who will literally capture the attention of the entire world. Every single human being is going to know about these two men. So much so that Revelation 11 verse 9 says that after these two preachers are killed, it says, verse 9, for three and a half days men of every people, tribe, language and nation. That's the entire world will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. They'll be on national television. The inhabitants of the earth, that's the world, will gloat over them. They will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets who tormented them on the earth are no more. The Bible tells us that everybody will know about these two preachers. Absolutely everybody. No doubt because of satellite television, because of Google, because of TikTok, because of all these things. The whole world is going to turn and gaze upon their bodies lying there in the street. Can you imagine the police forces and the governments of the world not even willing to move their bodies? The whole world will watch this. Why? Well, because of the tremendous and powerful impact that they would have had on society for the glory of God. For they will clearly and powerfully preach God's word without compromise, unadulterated, right across the web, day after day, morning, noon and night, they will be preaching the word of God. You will turn on the television, there they will, will be. You will go onto Google and they will be preaching. And they will have the power to literally stop the rain across the earth. Power to turn fresh water into blood. To strike the world with every imaginable uh, play. Droughts and cyclones and tornadoes. Thousands of people, perhaps us sitting here today, our children, our grandchildren, are going to hear these men preaching from the western wall in Jerusalem. They will see them on the web. There will be this huge wall with the dome of the rock which will be on top of it and, and, and so on. And they will see these preachers standing there preaching the word of God. And thousands of people will turn to Jesus Christ because of them. But millions will hate. Millions will turn against God. And if anybody tries to harm them, God's word says that fire will literally come out of their mouths and destroy them. And the whole world, the Bible says, will be tormented by their threats and literally by their warnings. Tormented because they refuse to turn and believe in the gospel of salvation that is through God's Son, Jesus Christ. There is only one means of salvation. There is no other way to God than through Christ. As Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. You see, believing is not just knowing things about God. Many people in life know many things. Many people can quote the Bible to you backwards and forwards and scripture verses and chapters. But to believe is to know it, to be true for one's own life and soul, and then to go out in life and to live it. You see, a man or a woman has not heard God's word until they obey it. And they live that word out to the glory of Jesus Christ. Repenting of their sin. And then living a brand new life in relation to Jesus Christ. Because of what they then believe. Our lives are to be different for Christ. But you see by this point in the world. People will refuse to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They may not be happy with their own lives. Yes. They may look back at their lives and their lives are filled with darkness and misery and complexities and day after day it's the same drudgery. They may believe their lives are completely messed up. I was at the hospital this week out in Timbison and I was in the parking lot talking to somebody and I gave him a Bible and he said my life is a complete mess but he did not want to know Jesus Christ. Didn't want to know him. 
But they will not be willing to make that type of commitment to Christ. That's the point. But God, our God, is a God of love. He will keep His servants preaching right up to the very end of time. Wow. It's reminiscent, isn't it, of Matthew 24, verse 14, where our Lord Jesus turns and He says of the coming end of the world, and this gospel of the kingdom, salvation, will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The Bible is going to be preached right up to the very end. Nothing is ever going to stop it. Nothing will stop the preaching of God's servants. All as God turns and He calls the world back to Himself. Our God is a loving God. He's a God of grace. But He calls men and women to repentance. Now that's just a brief overview of the chapter. And God willing, over the next few weeks we'll get more into that. But before we look at these two witnesses, there's a verse that we need to touch on today. Verses that have caused a tremendous amount of debate amongst Bible scholars. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. We find that John is told to go and do some measuring. And so I've got entitled this, The Temple Measured. Look at verse 1. John writes, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. Now the Apostle John had a lot of visions, but only once in a while did he get involved in a vision himself from God. Like Revelation chapter 4, where he talks to Jesus Christ, he sees things in unfolding, and suddenly he hears a voice and it says, come up here, and he goes right up into heaven, into the throne room of God, that is getting involved in a vision. He went up to heaven. Now here again, he is involved in the vision. He is told by someone to take a reed rod and go and measure the temple of God. Let's break this verse down so that we can get to grips to it. He says, verse 1, Revelation 11, I was given a reed, like a measuring rod, told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar. Now the word reed here is klamos in the ancient Greek, and it means a literal reed that grew in the Jordan Valley. And the reeds in that area grew somewhere between 10 to 15 feet high. They were quite high. They were hollow stalks, rather like you get bamboo stalks. And the ancient Israelites used them as measuring yard sticks. They were used as pens, so if you shaved them sharp enough and dipped them in your ink, you could write with them. Some people used them as walking sticks. Now here in this vision, John is told to take one and to use it to measure the temple of God, to measure the altar, to measure those standing there worshipping God. Now the question is obviously, why does God tell John to do this? Why has he got to do this? What is the point of all this? Well, the point is this. In Old Testament times, God used to measure something as a de declaration of ownership. Of ownership. The fact that God saw something as personally belonging to Him in life. He owned it for His own preservation. You see this, for example, again in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, verse 15. Where God has the new Jerusalem, the city of heaven, this glorious city in heaven, the capital city, measured. Look at Revelation 21.15. John says, The angel who talked with me has a measuring rod of gold, wow, to measure the city of heaven. Its gates, its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it is wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide <coughs> and high as it is long. In other words, the city of heaven isn't a fluffy cloud. It's not that you rock up there, Peter's on a fluffy cloud, and everybody's on fluffy clouds. That's not heaven. The city of heaven is a perfect cube. It is 1,400 kilometers high, 1,400 kilometers wide, 1,400 kilometers long. It is a perfect cube in heaven, an absolutely glorious city, street upon street upon street upon street upon street. I was to imagine escalators going up and down so that you can go from one place to the next. It is an absolutely glorious building. But it was measured by God, for He owned heaven, and He owns it. 
And it seems in a similar way that that is what John is instructed to go and do here. That temple is measured here in Revelation 1, 11, 1 in earthly Jerusalem because it belongs to God. God is identifying it as his own property. This is my property. John does not measure it. Measure the temple, measure the altar, measure all the people that are there. And this is particularly true because John is told, Revelation 11 verse 1, Go and measure the temple of God, the altar, and the worshippers. In other words, God would be measuring off here those people in Israel who would be seeking Him as God. they only in the temple because they're wanting to know God. And He says, I want you to measure them. Almost as it were, to put them in protective, favoured custody. To put them in a position of protection. Did you get that idea? You say, how do you know this is speaking of the future, Mark? Well, glad you asked. <coughs> the reason is, is because John wrote the book of Revelation in 96 AD. But in AD 70, 26 years earlier, a war had broken out between Rome and the people of Israel. And a Roman army, the 10th Legion under Titus, had destroyed the city of Jerusalem had absolutely leveled the temple to the ground to get the gold out of the walls. And they banned all Jews from the city of Jerusalem. In fact, the Romans removed the name Jerusalem completely and named the city Antilia Capitolina. That was the name. So that there was no more city of Jerusalem. It was Antilia Capitolina. There was no more temple. In fact, they were sacrificing to Zeus. They banned every Jew from the city. The Romans destroyed everything. 985 towns in Galilee were burnt to the ground and the people slaughtered. Over a million Jews died in that battle. The blood was so thick in some areas, a Jewish general says it started to put the fires out in the temple area. You say, Mark, are you saying that in the modern city of Jerusalem, the temple's going to be rebuilt again? Now? Yes. That's why, why, for example, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, it says of a coming Antichrist world leader, the 666, that he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up where? In God's temple, naos in the Greek, proclaiming himself to be God. He cannot sit in a temple if there is no temple. Our Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 15, when He spoke about His coming return, put it this way. So when you see standing in the holy place, that's the temple, the abomination that causes desolation, Antichrist, spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Flee, you better run. In other words, this Antichrist, this world leader, the 666, this man who's going to unite the world and Europe under him, is going to walk into a rebuilt Jewish temple in the modern day city of Jerusalem and he's going to proclaim himself God in that Jewish temple in national television. And in doing so, he is going to offend the religious Jews and offend the government of Israel and break the peace agreement because the government is propped up by the religion. You say, when is this going to happen, Mark? Well, according to the prophet Daniel that Jesus spoke about, Daniel 9.27, look at this, it says, He, Antichrist, will confirm a covenant, that's a peace agreement, with many, that's Jews and Arabs, for one seven, that's seven years. In the middle of that seven, that's three and a half years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. He will ban Jewish worship in the temple. He will set up an abomination that causes desolation on the wing of the temple, until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. In other words, he'll put an image of himself there until Jesus destroys him. Or that is, what we see is that this world leader will sign a peace agreement with Israel for seven years to bring peace to the Middle East. And you can imagine they're going to jump at it. Three and a half years into that agreement, he personally will break it by walking into a rebuilt Jewish temple and proclaiming himself to be God. Expecting the world to worship him. It's after this that he forces, Revelation 13 verse 16, 
everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive what? A mark on their right hand or on their forehead, so that no one will buy or sell until he, unless he has the mark, which is the name of the beast, 666, or the number of his name. So he's going to force loyalty to himself. And so there will be a temple in Jerusalem in the last days. Wow. If I had time this morning and were able to, I would show you the advert that's been put out by Israel just on that coming rebuilt temple. Well, here in Revelation 11 verse 1, John is told to measure the temple and its worshippers. Now this would be before the Antichrist breaks the agreement. So it's in the first three and a half years, and John goes out and he measures that temple. All because it appears that the rebuilding of the temple is part of the peace agreement conditions for the Middle East. Israel will insist on it. You say, Mark, why will God allow a rebuilt temple with sacrifices now that Jesus has come and died on the cross to end sacrifice? Well, I'm glad you asked. It seems to me that God is going to allow to cause a modern Jewish nation to become conscious of their sins and the need for sacrifice over sin. And to cause the nation to look for a Messiah. Most Jews today are secular, they're traditionalists. They've lost and forgotten the significance of the temple. They don't think of sacrifice for sin. But one day when it's expected and a Jewish doctor here or a Jewish plumber in South Africa has to fly over to Israel and take a lamb and have it sacrificed for his and his family's sins, suddenly it becomes conscious. Suddenly they've got to ask questions, why? They become conscious of sin, they become conscious of sacrifice, they become conscious of the need of a Messiah. Or is the meaning of the temple causes hearts in Israel to start seeking God again? And so the angel in Revelation 11.1 turns to John and he says, Go and measure what belongs to God, the temple and its worshippers. Because God is about to do something in this place. God is about to save Israel. Romans 11.25, the apostle says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the mystery, my brothers. So that you may be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. In other words, uh, they've turned against <coughs> Jesus largely. Until the full number of Gentiles, non-Jews, has come in. In other words, the Jews have been, non-Jews have been saved. And then God draws the line. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, a deliverer will come from Zion, that's Jesus. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, Israel. And this is my covenant with them when I take away who? Their sins. God in the last days is going to save Israel spiritually. Thousands of Jews are going to turn to Jesus. At this point, thousands of Jews have accepted Jesus. But one of these days, an entire nation will turn to God. Now, do you know what this all tells us as we come to a close? It tells us that our God today, are you ready? Is a covenant God. Amen? Amen. In that when God makes a covenant with people, God never breaks that covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of Israel. He made an agreement with Moses that Israel would be his people. Amen? And God will not break it. He will never, ever let Israel go. And you know that is a great comfort to you and I as the Christian church. Because God made a New Testament covenant through Jesus Christ of salvation, and He will never let you and I go either. If God turned His back on His covenant that He made with Israel, He could turn His back on the covenant He made with us. But He won't. Our, one could say that the majority of Israel has been unfaithful to God by the rejection of Jesus Christ the Messiah. But God is one who will one day call the entire nation to turn and accept Jesus Christ. That day is coming biblically. In the prophecy of Zechariah 12.10, 470 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it says in Israel of Jesus, And I, God, will pour out on the house of David, that's Israel, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, they will look on me, Jesus, the one they have pierced, crucified. Jesus wasn't even born yet for 470 years. But they're looking on the one they've pierced. And they will mourn for him, that is repentance, as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as a firstborn son. Zechariah 13.1 
On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse, wash them from sin and impurity. Israel will be forgiven their sins by God and saved. There are many times when we as Christians have been unfaithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, haven't we? Just sit back and think of our lives. We know the truth of God, and yet how many times do we fail God in life by our own sinful lives? But God, through Jesus Christ, never lets you and I go ever. Why? Because our God is a covenant God. He sticks to His agreements. Wow. Isn't our God a wonderful God? It reminds me of 2 Timothy 2.13. It says, if we are faithless, He, God, remains faithful. Because He cannot disown Himself. That's wonderful, isn't it? Is Jesus Christ your Savior this morning? Have you called upon Jesus to be the Lord of your life? The Lord of your thoughts? The Lord of your attitudes? Have you turned away from your sin? Do you walk in a brand new relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, if you have, the God of covenant loves you. But if Jesus is not your Savior this morning, and you know it in your heart, in that your sinful desires and your attitudes really rule your life day after day after day. And you know that you're living against God's commands. Well, God, the covenant God, turns and calls you today to repent. To live your life and do a U-turn and start living for Christ. To embrace Jesus in your life. Won't you do that this morning? For the time is short. It's bad. Perhaps this morning you want to say something to the Lord about your life. Maybe you just need to recommit your heart to Christ. You've allowed your sinful nature and your desires to rule. Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you need to ask Him to be your Savior. Perhaps you feel that you just need to recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you want to, maybe somebody here doesn't know the Lord Jesus. Maybe you'd like to pray this prayer quietly in your heart after me. <coughs> Heavenly Father, you are our covenant loving God. I come before you this morning and I confess that I'm a sinner. I have lived my life my own way my desires, my sinful heart. I am sorry and repent of all my sin. Thank you for sending Christ to die in my place. Please forgive me as you have promised. Please give me your gift of eternal life. I want to live for you from today on. Help me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In John 6, 47, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. He who believes has eternal life.